My name is Mark Lozier. I work at Ocean's East. I've fished and lived here for since 88, so I've got a little bit of time and experience around here. I'm predominantly an artificial angler. I love fishing in the skinny water for reds, trout, and I say skinny, but in the inlets, the creeks, the river for trout, reds, flounder, striper. Anyway, so we're going to go over some artificial lures, rods, reels, things like that that I use. Um, doesn't make it right or wrong, it's just what I prefer. Um, as I started with, I fished from a kayak, so it's given me a lot of time to be a lot more concise, I guess, about my fishing as opposed to the people on the boats. When I decide where I'm going to fish that day, that's where I'm going to fish. I don't have the ability to put the screws to it and go somewhere else. So I've learned over time how to work an area, what the, what the fish prefer, what's going on out there, and kind of how to read the, the water, if you will, at the time. So 60% to 80% of a great fishing trip is done before you even untie that boat knowing the tides, the wind, where the fish, you know, wh what's going on out there in the water. And I always give the example like with the redfish. I'll use reds a lot because that's my favorite thing to target. As they go through a season, in the spring and in the fall, your fin baits, I call them, or your mullet, menhaden type of artificials, things like that, is their preferred diet. Summertime, we use a lot of crab, shrimp, and stuff like that for them. Well, it's a lot like you and I. In the summer, you don't go get a big pot roast meal when it's 99 degrees out. You get a cold salad, a cold sandwich. In the wintertime, you eat those bigger, heartier meals, keep the carbs going, try to keep yourself, and you don't mind because it's colder out. Well, it's the same thing with fish. They don't need to be weighted down. They don't need all that. But in the wintertime, they're trying to get their fat content up because there's less food. So they got that to store throughout the winter. And then when the spring comes around, it's all one big cycle again. So those are things right there, There's small little keys to key in on. So once you've kind of figured that out, how they work, how they spawn, things like that, what time of the year they do that, you can figure out the diet. Just like a trout. A trout eats a lot of mullet when it's going to spawn its eggs because it's a higher fat content. So they're broadcast spawners. So when they spawn, their eggs broadcast and they get clung on grass clumps and all. So when they do that, the fat content helps those eggs float to get caught up where they're going. When they're not in the spawn, then they're just having a lighter diet. They're not eating as much and as active. So just thinking about those things. A lot of people cut up in a trout, they've kept one, and they think that they're just about to spawn because they're eggs. Trout hold their eggs and they periodically spawn four to six times throughout a season. So just to give you an idea of how many times they're spawning throughout the year. Another big thing when you get out there is I see a lot of people, they motor right on in to where they're gonna fish. They just come in full tilt and then they start casting. You've done nothing but push them away. Creep in real slow if you got a trolling motor, if you got a push pole, or if you can just put that motor at idle or let the wind kind of shove you in. And once you get in there, start looking around. Look for bait, look for little signs of food, whether it's little mullet jumping, shrimp coming out of the grass. If there's no food there, there's probably no fish there. Unlike you and I, they don't have to work, they don't have to pay taxes, they just gotta eat and make babies. I mean, they, you know what I'm saying? So you wanna make sure that there's some food around. If there's no life for them, they're not gonna be there either. So be looking around, scouting, see if you see any bait or anything swimming around, crabs crawling on the bottom if the water's clear enough, things like that will help you cue in on where you should be. Once we get out there on the water, we're looking for most of the time choke points, places where the water confluences into a little bowl or eddy. Um, I always give the example, when you're picking a species to target, if they have a flat tail, they're an ambush feeder. They sit in the current, they sit behind a dock piling on the other side of an oyster bar, and they just wait. That tail keeps them in place. They just wait for that meal to come by, and then they take it. Fish that have a fork tail, they like it fast. Spanish mackerel, marlin, everything with fork tail, you troll, you go fast for. So if you're out there targeting redfish and you're cranking it like this, he's going to do this. He's just going to watch it go by. They're not going to exert any more energy than they have to to come after the meal. So just be thinking about that too when you're out there. So remember, flat tail, slow it down. Fork tail, you know, when you're trolling for Spanish, you catch blues, what do we do? We speed it up. You get even faster. So that fork tail lays down and they, they, they put the afterburners on and chase it down. So there's more cues, more things to be thinking about when you start picking species to target. The other nice thing about the trout, flounder, and redfish when you're fishing for those, you can pretty much all catch all of them on the same lures that one from the other. So there's a lot of good bycatch. That's why you see up and down the East Coast, there's a lot of tournaments that are inshore slam tournaments 
and those are the three species that they target in those tournaments and then they have like a combined length or wit, um, weight for them and that's how the tournaments go because there's a good chance you can catch all three of them in the same spot same kind of area again because they're ambush feeders they're hiding behind oyster bars little sloughs so when you get out there on the water and you start dissecting and pick it apart so you got some marsh areas so you always want to be down current and casting up current. I see a lot of times where the current's going and people are casting with the current. It does, you know, the bait is naturally going to get drug out of those marshy areas, out of the flats, but it's just like a bird in the wind. Same thing with the bait. So don't be throwing down current and bringing it back up if that makes sense because it's not natural. And remember, we're trying to fake that fish basically into thinking this artificial is the real deal. One of the reasons too I should have probably started that I, I don't use bait and I'm not saying that bait's not good or it doesn't work it's not effective is there's a lot of hurry up and wait when you use bait you're basically taking a chance that you put that out there and something's going to swim by because you're not going to cast and retrieve cast and retrieve a live mullet he's just going to fly off the hook about the second cast so you're basically sitting it out there and you're waiting so with the artificials you can dissect an area you can cast and you can get rewarded for all the money you spent on lures too and catch a fish hopefully in the meantime it's pretty simple too when you get into the artificial side of things you don't need a bunch of gear you don't need a bunch of sizes and all kind of crazy stuff again from the kayak perspective i have a little leniency on the size of what I use and my drag and stuff because they can drag me and that's less drag I have to use. If you're in an anchored boat, it's a constant toe-to-toe -to -toe battle with the fish until you get them in, depending on the size, obviously, of the species. So typically I go with nothing less than a seven foot rod. You can go up to seven, six. Medium action will pretty much cover everything that you want to do. We could get real technical here today and like I like a medium light fast tip for my mirror lures. I have different rods for different applications, but in general a medium. Um, you may go up to a medium heavy if you're getting into some of the bigger redfish. Um, with a trout, the lighter is really better. They have that soft mouth. So once you start horse, horsing one in, you're gonna come back with a set of lips sometimes where you get that big hole in their face and anytime that line goes slack, she's gone, you know, so you don't want to overpower a trout for sure. Um, real size, no bigger than a 3000. Um, two reasons for that is, again, we're not catching, you know, a big running fish. The other thing is, remember, you, we're casting all day, five, six, 700 times if you're really out there. Lighter is better. The lighter your rig is, the less fatigue you're gonna become. Um, so try to look for something like that, the best that you can put into it. Leader material, I always tie a leader to my braid. Two reasons for that are you never want to gra grab your braid. So if something happens and you need to grab the line, I'd much rather grab floral than mono. Braid's going to cut you open. The other thing is, is every time I'm changing a lure, I'm cutting line. 10 cents a yard, 3 to 4 cents a yard. You can do the math pretty quick. And every time you cut this, this spool is getting narrower. If you get snagged or hung on something, you're not going to break this braid. You will break off this mono. You may lose a jig head or something in the process, but you haven't lost all that line that you're up there trying to cut at the tip of your rod and retie. So the leader material helps in a lot of different reasons. I typically use an Albright knot when I connect here. Uh, there's a billion knots out there. You can go on YouTube and make yourself dizzy trying to figure out all the different connection knots. The Albright's the quickest and easiest for me to tie, especially now I have to wear glasses so you get out there on a sunny day. I tie everything in the garage once and hope nothing breaks because I get out there in the water. But um, yeah, so an Albright knot, uni to uni is probably a little easier, but it doesn't go through the guides as well. You can hear it click, click, click and gets hung up in there, the uni version. So the double all right, you can see that's a pretty slim knot. Wind knots, how many of you get wind knots in your spinning gear? Two main reasons that you get wind knots. A is people that, and I'm not gonna call you out, but do you throw the bale manually or do you use the handle? If you're using the handle, manually is the way you wanna go with the spinning reel. Don't use the handle to close the reel. But that line is coming off so fast. What happens is, is it kind of lays over itself because it's coming off the reel. And this is another reason why I like bait casters. So when it's coming off, I mean, you can look at that. that not, that's the turns every time as it's coming out. So when it's going, the resistance of the wind is causing it to overrun itself. So when you ring it back in, it's less and less tight on your spool. So when it comes back in, it's falling over itself. Top water lures. Anybody here use top water for their salt? I'll catch I, a carp on top order if I could. I mean, tarp, top water is the most fun, exciting way to fish. Um, but now this is where things change a little bit for me. I go down to an 18 inch or even 12 inch piece of leader. 
The shorter leader is so when you're casting, a lot of times you know you like when you cast something with treble hooks, the line gets caught in it before you even start fishing. So now I have a shorter piece here to cause that pro to take away from that problem. The other thing is when that's laying out there, that line's going to start sinking. And every time I try to walk the dog, I've lost energy in that plug because I got to get the line out of the water. It's not going to walk until it's on top of the water. So the shorter piece is going to less sink and I can get work in the bait. There's, you know, there's a lot of rules, a lot of things people say, like once you've casted the top water, wait till all the rings disappear. And I, I cast it, I start working it. I don't pay attention to that. Another big thing that I don't listen to is everybody says it's got to be in gray light conditions. You only use top water in the morning or in the evening. I've caught the biggest trout my, I've ever caught on this exact plug years ago at about 12 o'clock and there wasn't a cloud in the sky. So, you know, I, I see it. I've, I just saw it the other day and the guy on a show, the guy was like, yeah, the only time you really do anything good is early morning and in the evening. If you're throwing big baits and you're looking for big fish and they want to eat, they're going to eat. They don't, they don't care. If you see something going on behind your bait, do not stop. Keep walking the dog. Once you stop, that fish will lose interest in it. This thing was doing this. Do not set the hook until it comes tight. I, you, a lot of people, you know, as soon as you see it go down, they want to set the hook and they just plug goes flying out of the water. A topwater bait works well because it's basically giving up the ghost bait. Just like anybody here, offshore fish, when you troll, you got 17 rods. I'm exaggerating, but you got a bunch of rods on the boat and the dead center is the hook bait way, way, way back. Everything else in the water is just to cause to tease the fish up there. And that one way, way, way back is the one that can't keep up with everything else. So that's the easier meal. You know, the slowest kid on the playground always gets out first, right? So same thing with fishing. That's why that top water bait works so well. I always tell people, come in the shop and look over the wall where we keep all of our gudgeons. And there's always some up there just kind of giving up the ghost, flopping on the top. So that's why that top water, and plus the commotion and everything makes it work better. But yeah, so it's the easier meal. If the whole school's swimming, there's the one dying behind it, the older or whatever one, that's the meal they're gonna take first. So, but top water, I'll throw top water every, I'll start with top water for a while and then I'll switch it up. And that's usually how I like to leave the dock. I have a top water tied on. I have something that'll run mid column, like a mirror lure. And then I'm gonna have a jig, something heavier that's gonna work the bottom. So I can work the whole water column as I want to when I'm out there. I'm not retying as much, I'm just trying to be you know, efficiency, the more time these things spend in the water, the more time they're gonna catch fish. If you're constantly changing colors, constantly changing lures, you're gonna lose some of the battle. Several, this has become probably one of the most popular in the mirror lure family, the Miradine series. So there's three size, well, there's technically there's four sizes. So this is a 27, or some people call it an XL. And then there is the 17, it's a little smaller. And there's also in this same size, it's called, it's an 18, or it's called a heavy dine. So it's the same size bait, but it sinks a little more. And then there's an XL, which is much bigger than the first one I showed you. So those are the four sizes of the Miradine series. On the back of the package, there's gonna be a bunch of numbers or letters. And basically all that breaks into is color code. The bait itself has a series number. So like I said, this is a 17. Now when you look at a 17 MR, it's gonna say 17 MR. So here's what MR means. M is mirror lure, R means rattle. If it says 52 M, it's 52 is the series size. M is mirror lure, there's no R, no rattle. Now there's a TT, tiny trout. You ever seen the one that's got all little dots all over it? So TT is tiny trout, TTR is tiny trout with rattles, right, see? Then the colors, some have color codes like the famous 808, which is the black, orange, belly one that we used to be real popular in the river, that's an 808. But once you know the color codes, you can find that color in every bait they make if they make it in that, if that makes sense. So the 808 comes in this size, that size, this 52, TT, blah, blah, blah. Makes sense? So in the beginning, hold on to some of your packages so you can kind of understand which colors are working. I know a guy who's an incredible trout fisherman and I always, so what'd you catch him on today? And he used to spit out the numbers and I let like, well, what color is that? Well, he's colorblind. So he put package in his crate, he put his numbers where each one and they go back in there. So he didn't, he just tried them by, he knew his number system, but that's how I kind of learned this. So anyway, so it can get, it can get overwhelming. It can get very confusing, but it's a great bait to use. With that style, that Dean style, as I called it, um, 
you can never work them too slow. You can work them too fast. So I always tell everybody, slow down and then slow down some more. You want that bait, again, it's doing what a top water basically does. You twitch, twitch, and you pause. It's doing a twitch, and it's slowly sinking. Twitch, twitch, slowly sinking. It's a slow sinking, suspending bait. So it gives that illusion again of something that's about to give up the ghost that can't keep up with the rest of the crowd, the easier meal. The other thing I'm a big fan of is plastics. I throw more plastics than anything else. I use all Z-Man products, and 90% of the reason I use it is right here. The Elastec material that it's made with makes it much more resilient than any other plastic on the market. Just an incredible material. That same Elastec resilience also gives it a lot more buoyancy, so you don't have to overwork it in the water. If I had a tank here and I was able to sit this down, that tail is going to do just that. The buoyancy of it itself, it'll pick a 30 second, like the little bass Ned rigs that they use, it'll pick the jig head off the bottom. That's how buoyant it is and how much resilient. So it'll sit there and it'll swim. So as you're working it back for like redfish and you just let it hit that bottom, that jig is gonna sit there. It's gonna bounce up again. It's gonna keep working its way back. So it doesn't take as much work. Because every time you do, the more rod tip hopping you do, you're taking it out of the strike zone every time. And eventually that fish is just gonna be, you know, if I kept giving you a cupcake and doing that, eventually you're gonna be like, screw you, I don't want a cupcake. Well, same thing with that. So the more you can work the bait and the more natural it can look, because in the beginning I said, we're trying to fool that fish. There's no fish that woke up wanting to chew on a Z-Man. So you're trying to make sure that they, they think it's the real deal. Popping cork, how many people use a popping cork? It's an effective way to fish. So the main thing with the popping cork is you want to make sure that you're suspending your bait about one third to a half quarter of the water column that you're fishing. The job behind this popping cork is it's you're popping and waiting, walking the dog. Same, you're causing the same situation, but you're doing it with this cork. So the fish by nature is gonna come up to see what this is, but hanging down below it is whatever you've put on the hook. You can use live bait, dead bait, artificial, whatever it may be. So as they're coming up, they ambush it, they're gonna take this meal. All right, well, I'll be in the booth the rest of the day. If you guys got any questions, if you wanna see anything else, come on up here, you can take a look at it.